I'm preparing for operations on Ron's Trains and Things right now. Hi, I'm Ron of Ron's Trains and Things, and if you'd like to see more Model Railroad tips, tools, and techniques, then be sure and subscribe down below and click that little bell icon so you can catch future videos. Every model railroader has those aspects of the hobby that bring him or her the greatest sense of satisfaction and enjoyment. For me personally, one of those areas of great satisfaction is in the area of operations. Whenever we begin to move our trains around the layout in such a way as to simulate the moving of commodities from one place to another, it gives our railroad a sense of purpose, it gives it a sense of connection to the real world, and it brings the model railroad to life. Well today I'm going to show you how I am setting up for operations on my model railroad layout, and hopefully that'll be helpful to you as you set up for operations. Do you enjoy operations on your layout, or do you prefer just rail fanning trains? If you are set up for operations, what kind of scheme are you using? Let me know in the comments down below. Now let's talk a little bit about setting up for operations, and I'll show you how I'm going to operate my layout. There are a variety of ways that you can set up operating schemes on your layout. I'm going to be using car cards and four cycle waybills, which has been one of the more popular schemes for many years. The particular car cards and waybills that I'm using come from Micromark, and I'll provide a link to them down in the description. Now, as we're setting up our waybills, we discover that there is certain information that we need in order to be able to route them from one place to another on our layout. We need to know the consignee or receiver of the goods in the car and the address or city where it's located. There's room to provide routing and via information, which helps operators to know how to get the car from one place to another. Then, of course, there's also shipper and address information, which tells us where the commodity in the car is coming from. And finally, we need to know the lading or the cargo that the car is carrying. In order to gather all of this information to be able to fill out our waybills, we need to do a traffic pattern analysis of our layout. Now, that sounds pretty complicated, but the fact is it can be as simple or as complicated as we choose to make it. Basically, a traffic pattern analysis is a survey of the industries on our layout the types of goods that they either ship or receive, the types of cars that are needed in order to be able to ship and receive those goods, and of course the number of spots that are available for cars to be placed in each industry on the layout. Now, as I did my traffic pattern analysis, I chose to put that information into a spreadsheet using Microsoft Excel, but you can do it manually with a pencil and paper just as well. Now, in order to try to simplify understanding this process, let me show you how I did the traffic pattern analysis on a portion of my layout. So, as I look at the industries in Saginaw, Texas, specifically the ones along North Yard, I begin with the interchange with the Fort Worth and Western Railroad. Now, I want to mention the interchange because interchanges are great elements to include in a model railroad, especially from an operations perspective, because an interchange is like a universal industry. You can switch virtually any kind of commodity and virtually any kind of a car in and out of an interchange. In this case, my Fort Worth and Western interchange can handle up to eight cars at a time. Moving on up the yard, next we have Atterbury Grain. Atterbury Grain ships grain in covered hoppers and can handle up to 12 cars at a time. Also in the foreground, I want to mention my service facility, as this facility can serve as an industry on the layout as well. It could receive gondolas filled with wheel sets, covered hoppers filled with sand for the sanding tower, and tank cars for the diesel fuel facility. We won't include it in our list that we're looking at today, but if you have service facilities, you don't want to forget to think about them whenever you're thinking about the industries that you'll switch on your layout. This blank section along the back of my layout is where Victory Blue will eventually be. Victory Blue makes diesel exhaust fluid, and these two tracks that are just laying in place are approximately where the service tracks will be for Victory Blue. Victory Blue will receive urea and deionized water in covered hoppers and in tank cars. It can also ship out diesel exhaust fluid uh, packaged on pallets in box cars as well as in bulk in tank cars. The service tracks here can hold up to 10 cars. 
This large warehouse is undecided as to exactly what it's going to be. I've changed my mind several times, and so I'll figure that out as we go along. But what I do know is that it can handle up to six cars at a time, and I envision this switching primarily box cars. Next, we have P&O Cold Logistics. P&O Cold receives frozen meat products in refrigerator cars and can hold two cars at a time. Evergreen Feeds receives grain and mineral supplements and ships out bagged livestock feeds. It can handle covered hoppers as well as box cars and can hold four cars at a time. And finally in this area is Universal Forest Products. Universal Forest can handle four cars at a time in its tracks, and it receives primarily lumber on center beam flat cars, but can also receive other building materials in box cars as well. And once I have gathered all of this information about industries on my layout, I want to compile it into a spreadsheet, something like this. Now again, you can do this by hand on a sheet of paper with pencil or a pen. Uh, I prefer to do it in the, the neatest way possible, which for me personally is in a spreadsheet. Here you can see I have my traffic pattern reference sheet. Down the left side I have listed every industry that switches on my layout, including the interchanges. And I also want to remember to include the staging yards wherever they may be on your layout. And then there are columns that represent what that industry can receive and what types of cars it can receive those commodities in, and also a column representing what that industry can ship out and what types of cars are needed for that. For our project today, we're going to focus on this small area of the layout, specifically the industries that we looked at a few moments ago in Saginaw along North Yard. And here you can see I have listed all of the information that I gathered while ago. Each industry has a number under it, which represents the number of cars that can be held and the trackage for that industry, and then the products that they receive. The cars that are listed there are car types listed by AAR designation. If you're not familiar with AAR designations, you can find a list of these online, or you can simply use the names of the types of cars if you prefer. In my case, I find it easier to use these two-letter symbols that take up less space as I'm writing them. And you just get used to knowing what they mean. The LO that you see there by Atterbury Grain represents a covered hopper. A couple lines below that you see the XM. That is a box car. Standard nomenclature for that. The TAs, of course, are tank cars. And I simplify my symbols a little bit. TA represents all tank cars rather than using the variety of designations that can normally designate lots of different kinds of tank cars. Now that we've gathered this information, we're ready to use it to begin filling out the way bills for our cars. Now that we've gathered the information we need to begin filling out our car cards and way bills, we're going to start with this covered hopper right here. And we are going to start with one of the industries that we've been looking at, which is Atterbury Grain, which we have seen uh, receives grain in covered hoppers. Here is our car card for this car, and as you see, it has a place for some information here uh, with regard to the car itself. It has a place for us to write in the kind of car it is, the AAR designation, as we talked about a little bit, uh, the reporting marks, the railroad and number, and a description of the car. Now, I could do that by hand, uh, but as an inscaler, Sometimes I uh, find that my operators need a little bit of help because sometimes the reporting marks can be very small and hard to read on InScale. And I found a little trick that really helps me out on InScale, and it can help you out on any scale as far as that's concerned. And that is I take photographs of all of my cars and I shrink them down and print them along with this information on address labels. And this is actually the car card for this car on my previous layout. And you can see, obviously, I've weathered the car since I took this photograph. Uh, but I have the car designation, LO, for covered hopper, reporting marks, BN, and the road number. And instead of a written description, I actually have a picture of the car. So they can quickly look at the car card and identify the car on the layout. This is a great trick. I love to do this. And the people who operate on my layout find that they really, really like that. So that's uh, how I will be filling in uh, this information for the car itself. Then, 
for uh, this car pocket, we have a four cycle way bill. And we're going to start filling out this way bill for this car with cycle number one. Now, uh, the consignee or the receiver on this particular car is going to be Atterbury Grain. So I'm going to write that in here. And Atterbury Grain is in Saginaw, Texas. So I'll write that on the address line. Now, one of the things that I told you, you could add as much or little detail to this process as you like. Uh, and part of that comes into researching where commodities come from or are shipped to off of your layout. If you simply want to say that your commodities are coming from somewhere in the east or somewhere in the west or a, a, a city or a state, you, you can do that. You don't need a lot of detailed information. But I kind of like to make connections to the real world. So I've done a little research as to where many of the commodities that I ship and receive either go to or come from off the layout in the real world. And so in this case, this shipment of grain coming to Atterbury is coming from a shipper called Continental Grain. So I'm going to write that right here. I'm going to abbreviate that, Continental Grain. And that's in Stockton, California. And uh, this is hauling, um, in this case, soybeans. So I'm going to write that on here. If you wanted to get very detailed, you could also write a tonnage that the car would be carrying. I'm not, uh, I'm not doing that. And then to help your operators, you want them to help to know exactly how this is going to, to be shipped. Now, in my case, this is fairly obvious because Atterbury Grain sits right on North Yard. And, uh, and Continental Grain, of course, is represented in uh, my West End staging. But to help any of my operators who may not be as familiar with my layout, I'm going to note that on uh, the, the way bill itself. So on routing, I'm going to simply write West Staging and via uh, where is it going to come through on the layout in order to get where it's going. And it's going to come through North Yard. And there is one cycle of the waybill uh, ready uh, to run. And then, of course, this, since this is coming to Atterbury Grain in cycle one, on that traffic pattern analysis sheet I showed you a while ago, I'd place a single tick mark under cycle one because this is one car that's going to be coming to Atterbury Grain uh, in cycle one. If we think ahead a little bit, we would realize that this is coming to Atterbury Grain out of West Staging. And so, therefore, obviously it has gone into West Staging in Cycle 4. Uh, since it's a four-cycle way bill, uh, after Cycle 4 you go back to Cycle 1 again. And so I know that in Cycle 4 uh, this has to be in West Staging. So on that same sheet I could make a tick mark on the Departures line. Uh, for West Staging, and I can go ahead and write in Cycle 4 that this needs to go to West Staging in that cycle. Uh, so th that kind of gives us a sense of how we begin to fill these uh, these waybills out. And then obviously in Cycle number 2, this is going to start in Saginaw, Texas at, at Atterbury Grain. So in Cycle 2, we'll need it to depart there, so we'll make a tick mark in Departure. And down here under Cycle 2, we would figure out a new uh, consignee, either on the layout or off the layout in staging, and uh, fill out that way bill so we'll know where it's going to go. But for the sake of Cycle 1 anyway, we know where this uh, car is going to end up. So if we're going to set up our layout uh, as if we're going to start at the end of Cycle 1, we would put this car in Atterbury Grain, and we would put the car card in the appropriate box for the particular track in Atterbury Grain, either track 1 or track 2, that the car is sitting on. And that gives us enough information to begin to uh, set up and understand the process for operations. Uh, now we just need to continue this process for all four cycles and for all the cars on our layout to begin to place them on the layout under the cycle where they would begin for our very first operating session. Now as we fill out our traffic pattern analysis, and we see here we have this one arrival in cycle one on Atterbury Grain. This will help us to keep track of how many cars are coming and going 
from each industry for each particular operating cycle. And knowing how many cars we can have in the industry tracks in each industry, uh, this can help us from overloading our industries. Also, this will help us better understand how many and what types of cars and rolling stock we need on our layout. There's no need to particularly buy uh, rolling stock for operating sessions if it's not used in some of the industries on our layout. Now you may choose to buy some other rolling stock that doesn't fit into these industries. On my layout I have a few cars that don't fit into any industries on my layout and they simply run in through trains from one end of the layout and staging to staging in the other end just because they fit into my era and I find them interesting. For example, I have some auto racks. I have no place on my layout for auto racks to be delivered, but I like to run a couple of them because I like the way they look and because they fit the time period, and so I just run them from staging to staging. But this will help us to better get a handle on how many cars we need, what types of cars we need, so that it will inform our purchasing as well as help us to set up operations uh, effectively. We're going to come back in a later video and talk a little more about completing the way bills and about getting the layout set up for that first operating session as well as filling out switch lists in order to prepare for that session. So I hope that you will watch for that video as it comes out. Getting set up for operations takes us one step closer to being able to hold operating sessions which gets us that much closer to being able to share our layout and the hobby with friends. In a future video, I'll show you how to take what we did here today and set up your layout for your first operating session, getting all your cars set, your car cards in place, and making out switch lists for that first operating session. If you enjoyed this video, here's a link to some more videos that I know you'll enjoy as well. I also hope you'll give this video a thumbs up down below. Be sure and share it wherever model railroaders hang out. And of course, subscribe and click that bell icon so you can catch future videos. Before you go, I hope you'll check out the description down below this video where you'll find a link to my Amazon page, my Patreon page, as well as ways that you can connect with Ron's Trains and Things on social media. I'll also provide a link to those Micromark car cards and waybills in the description so you'll want to check that out. Well, I hope you'll join me again next Tuesday as I bring you another great Model Railroad segment, and I look forward to seeing you then. Ten, Lizzie?